Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. This is your host, Taylor, and welcome to episode 108. We will be speaking with the lovely Dr. Chris Donahue, and this is the first episode in eight episodes where we are back in the U.S. This episode was recorded on a trip to L.A. and got to meet with Dr. Chris Donahue actually first in Seattle for a training with the Sexual Health Alliance, where I am getting certified as a sex therapist. He was the trainer for one of the courses, one of my workshops, and just was absolutely fantastic. All of my notes on him were just, it was a lot of notes I took. Yeah, he had a lot of great things to say, and I learned a lot. And uh, you all also asked some questions during my Instagram Live, uh, during that training with Sexual Health Alliance, and their trainings are also open to the public. So you don't only have to be in the helping field to attend their trainings. If you are just a little sex nerd and you want to learn more about sex or you just want to maybe become a sex nerd or you just want to learn some cool different things about sex. Um, We didn't get the best sex education in our, you know, education and our public education or private education even. Even within college, we don't necessarily receive any kind of sexual education. So attending their trainings could be a great way for you to kind of brush up on some of that. And I've absolutely loved working with them and will continue to share all my trainings with them. And as you'll see in this episode, you get access to really cool, awesome professionals to learn from where it's actually like a very fun experience experience. It's not this like boring, boring lecture. Um, so you can definitely check them out. And yeah, today's episode with Dr. Chris, I mean, I could have talked with him forever and I feel privileged and very lucky to say I consider him a friend now. Um, he is, you guys actually might recognize him aside from me talking about him on Instagram, uh, because he's an international lecturer, therapist, and educator. He is the director of clinical education for Sexual Health Alliance, the organization I was just mentioning. And he also hosted, he hosts and actually relaunched Loveline, a nightly radio show. And he's also co-host of the Amber Rose Show with Dr. Chris podcast, and he's a weekly expert on the Amber Rose Show. And he's also, he's got a handsome face, so you might really recognize him too, because he frequently co-hosts on The Doctor's TV show. Um, so super, super amazing to meet with him. I was also on Loveline um, the same night when we recorded this, which was so awesome to be on there and just it's so amazing what all the things that he's doing. Um, he has several books out that I highly recommend and you can check them out in the episode notes for this episode. Um, but today, honestly, just to kind of get you a little ready for this episode and what Chris and I talk about. Um, We talked about things like online dating. We did talk a lot about non-monogamy, the difference between having chemistry versus compatibility. Ooh, that was a good one. And how to honor your true self in your romantic and sexual relationships. We really challenge societal norms around sex and both definitely shared some personal experiences um, in regard to how to kind of evolve and grow sexually. Uh, So again, going into this episode, have some open ears, open heart, open mind. We're here to challenge ourselves, to learn, to be vulnerable, to put ourselves out there. And uh, I really hope, I think that there's a lot you can take away from this episode. It's one that I've gone back and listened to a few times. Um, So without any further ado... (laughs) Let's talk about it. All right. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and continue this conversation around all things sex. Yeah, I'm super happy to be here. Yeah. Um, And so I'm going to be on your show in a little bit as well. And um, can you tell us just a little bit about the shows you do? I feel like you do a lot of work. (laughs) I don't even know anymore what I do. (laughs) I think right now the main focus is hosting Loveline because it's relaunched after 25 years um, over here at Entercom. And uh, I do a podcast with Amber Rose and uh, travel and just do some lectures and trainings based on my books. Yeah, and that's part of how we got connected through Sexual Health Alliance. You do trainings through there as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's so great about that is I meet people like you, people that are just really passionate about the work. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it, it's great because, you know, the general population might listen to some of my work or read some of my books, but to work with people that are also in the field like yourself, we get to just go so much deeper. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I get to have these like powerful conversations around topics that I love. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I had so many questions through the training and you did a fantastic job. You're Thank just you. like such high energy. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from sometimes. I really don't. You know, yeah. I laugh at myself watching like the weird ways I'll sit or stand and yeah. the voices, but yeah, there it is. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Um, and it really, it felt like one of the things that I love about these trainings and just you know, talking with other people yeah. in the sex world is there's so much authenticity there and there's so much realness. Yes. And the, and because of that, there's so much you can connect with. Like, yes. I feel like I had so many light bulbs um, in, in this one training that, that we did. And the one major light bulb I had was around uh, chemistry and compatibility. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's such a powerful thing. And what's funny is I talked about this in the training, but just for the people that are listening, I was I was walking through Central Park, mm-hmm. and I was talking to a friend of mine, a very smart friend of mine, about a relational situation or a dilemma. And he was like, dude. And I was like, what? And he's like, you are so confused right now. And I was like, what's going on? And he's like, you are confusing chemistry and compatibility. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Because we get blown. lost in our own stuff. Yeah. Even as therapists, we, we can't always see ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And so we need people to reflect that back. But yes, the chemistry versus compatibility thing, game changer. Yeah. Really yeah. Is. Because cause you do get so, like all of your hormones and your emotions get wrapped up in the chemistry piece, right. Right? right? Whether it's like spiritual chemistry or sexual chemistry, or like emotional chemistry, yeah. that sometimes we're not even considering the compatibility piece. <laughs> and we think that the chemistry piece yes. is the compatibility. Yes. And it's like, why is there so much conflict? Why don't we get along? I'm so drawn to them or we have these things in common. It's like, because you're not compatible. Yeah. When the two of you come together, your personalities create something really horrible and unsustainable, even yeah. though you're so drawn to each other or you love these elements of each other, that doesn't mean that you're meant to be um, long-term relational partners. Yeah, It's heartbreaking to hear. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because that's this yes. idea. We think that like if we like someone enough or we're attracted to them enough that we can just be with whoever we want. And I think the lie also in therapy sometimes uh, from people within the field and outside the field is that we can make anything work yeah. and we can't. There's just some things that can't be done. Mm-hmm. See, I, I used to I used to really feel like that. I used to think in my relationships, like I would just be like, you know, I know that I know the skills, I know the tools. Like if we just apply this, like <laughs> we can <laughs> We can overcome anything. Yeah. Yeah. Can. And then I would reach a certain point where I was like, actually no, like sometimes it's just off and sometimes yeah. it's just really not right. Yeah. And and it it should not take that amount of right. work in order for it to feel like something that's fulfilling and healthy and sustainable. Yeah, and it's a scary thing because there's it's really hard to decide, I think, what what is too much. And that's kind of what every couple or person has to decide. Like what what is tolerable? And I feel mm-hmm. like I end up using that word a lot with people is is it tolerable? Because every relationship, as we all know, is mm-hmm. gonna have some work to be done. Yeah. But is it tolerable what it's gonna require? Because what what some people require is just for me personally, beyond what I'm willing to do yes. every day, you know? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Oof. And and when we look at the, the compatibility piece, can you maybe share a little bit of how people can start to really examine that compatibility yeah. and how they're able to see it separately from the chemistry? Yeah. Yeah. So chemistry, I think, is pretty easy, right? It's just about the, a desire or when you look at this person, how much you want to kiss them or fuck them or hug them or mm-hmm. how much you're drawn to them. But the compatibility piece is really about personality styles. Um, how, how high conflict are the two of you? Mm-hmm. How do the two of you deal with conflictual situations and differing opinions? And that's, and I use those concepts or those specific moments because I think those are when we see compatibility the most. When you disagree mm-hmm. or you have different needs or your needs aren't getting met or you're working through an issue, that's when it really comes to the surface. Yeah. But again, it's about what is it like when we're not having sex and we're not being romantic or affectionate and it's the two of us sitting there, what do our personalities come together and create um and whatever that answer is is that something you can tolerate for weeks months or years Mm -hmm. and you know in this person from which the example came when i was you know walking through central park talking to my friend i was like no there's a lot of chemistry but what happens when we come together and the kind of conflicts and issues we have because of the two of us no i I couldn't imagine that Mm -hmm. long term yeah that's uh, and then are you able to act on that 
Are you I, able to? I am because I hold myself accountable mm-hmm. so powerfully to doing the work that I talk about yeah. that I think the bar is really high for myself. Um, I'm not perfect, but I try to definitely apply my, my theories and my methods, but it's difficult. Um, and also what I have to take into account in all of that is that we have to also look at how our, I guess like our, um, our dating market value and then also our experiences, meaning, you know, I'm lucky in that I have a lot of dating opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm lucky in that a lot of the people I'm interested in are also interested in me. Mm-hmm. So I get to lean on, well, there's always other people. Yeah. Not everyone does. Mm-hmm. And so for some people, for whatever reason, uh, sadly, because of cultural norms, they don't necessarily meet a lot of the standards of what a lot of people are looking for. And so maybe they do have to hang in there mm-hmm. a little bit longer. And that's something I always feel like we have to kind of throw into the conversation. Not yeah. everyone can go on Tinder and have like 50 people hitting them up in a day. Yeah. Yeah. And even then, if you're in that situation and you got 50 people hitting me up a day, I mean, part of what you went over in the training as well was just about like mindfully using dating apps, oh, yeah. which I think since then actually it has been conversations I've had with my clients oh, because, good, good. Uh, yeah, it is super helpful. <laughs> I'm like, this is very relevant um, because people really do. They feel like burnt out from that because even when you have a lot of options, yes. is the quality there, is the, is the chemistry yeah. there? And is the time and energy there? Yeah. I'll tell you, I, I was just having this conversation an hour ago with a friend of mine where I was saying, mm-hmm. I, I'm burnt out. Yeah. I'm tired. I'm starting to get cranky. I'm starting to develop this internal model of like not, not trusting um, yeah. the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah. So I was saying to my buddy, I was like, I, I'm interested in someone. We're spending a lot of time together. And even though there's not a lot of um, history between us, I think I'm going to delete my apps in service of just taking a break and yeah. maybe just focusing on this person. And if it doesn't go anywhere, just still be on a break from the apps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is that where you're at? Dang. Well, I haven't been on apps for a while, but oh. partially for that reason. Okay. So I was in a long distance relationship for about a year and ended that in September. How long of a distance? Canada, Toronto to Seattle. I'm talking to someone right now in Toronto from California. <laughs> so I also am right now too. <laughs> I'm going to see you at the airport in Toronto. <laughs> High five on each other. We're going to have to like carpool, how, airplane, how has that been, Toronto. That trip. It's a trip. It is. It, it's it, a it's huge... not quick or cheap. Nope. It, exactly. Customs say, isn't quick. It's, it's a big investment to be in a long distance relationship. Yes. Um, and especially when, like you said, there's not a lot of history there. That's so right. like even right now, I'm kind of like building towards something with someone, but there is that distance there. And so there's a lot of gray area, you know, there haven't been conversations around like commitment or anything like that. And trying to navigate that is a really tricky place. And there's, there's for, for me, there's space for non-monogamy there and there's space for, um, you know, not necessarily dating apps because last year when I was on them, I did feel super burnt out and just like people, you know, going on a date and a guy being like, Oh yeah, I Googled you beforehand. Like you're on the bachelor is like <laughs> not you're like, uh, not what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah not I how I want to start my time. So, but again, I think you're like myself or I'm hearing you say this, that like I believe in love and relationality. And so I will put in the time and energy to see, mm-hmm. and if it fails me, I'll do it again with someone else long-term if I'm interested. Yeah. Cause to me it's important enough. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people like, do it, do it again again. And, um, I think it's worth it. So have you had any kind of conversation, even in like fantasy land Mm -hmm. of one of you moving to the other's place? So not yet. And what's interesting is in my last relationship, which was a year of long distance, um, that never came up as like a serious conversation, even like my lease came up in May. And so it was like, Oh, you know, like, do you want to, but it it was never like a legit conversation. And with this relationship now um he's contemplating perhaps in the next year um maybe like a new york or la type of move and in not my, new york like that's yeah, still not new coastal york. yeah and, and and in my brain i do jump quite a bit ahead and especially sure. when you are long distance i feel like you sure. do have to be intentionally to plan these things right. so in my head i'm like yeah you know if he were to live in la could i see myself moving you know and it's not a conversation we've had yet but when you're long distance, that's something you have to think about way sooner than you would living in the same city of like, do it's we want to live together? That's true. Yeah, it's true. But you like Seattle. I absolutely 
adore Seattle. What's so funny is when I came home from Seattle, I was telling everyone how much I love the weather, and people yeah. are blown away by that, but I love that kind of weather. I, mm-hmm. When I was there, I spent my free time just sitting outside. Everyone would be inside huddled in, yeah. and I'd be sitting outside on the like veranda or the mm-hmm. outdoor area by myself drinking coffee or a glass of wine, yeah. loving the weather. No, it is love beautiful, it. Yeah. and it's even in all the gray, <laughs> like there's so much beauty there. Right. And maybe I partially just, you know, get a little like woo-woo-y about it and like make it a very spiritual like yeah. big picture type thing sure. of like it's not always you know sunshine and butterflies <laughs> we life. have to acknowledge the darkness <laughs> the shadow yes and like growing comfortable and like g- building a viewing that for the beauty that's in it as Beautiful. well as opposed to just always looking at that as like a gloomy bad negative time you know of like, that's probably why you can also survive long distance because a lot of people i know would be like that sounds horrible and i say well it's different mm-hmm. but i i do honestly appreciate the ability to long for someone yeah. and the value you place on the time together mm-hmm. where you're not willing to maybe take the four days you have once a month to see each other to fight over something stupid yeah if mm-hmm. you can do it that way yeah yeah okay and i'm i'm yeah, so far there have been there have been uncomfortable conversations that we've had, but there hasn't been any kind of like argument or anything. But I, I do think in that sometimes in long distance, you can then miss some opportunities to see like the the compatibility in a relationship yeah. because yeah. you are avoiding those yes. tough conversations because you just want to enjoy your time together. That and also if you have a fight, there's nothing worse than not being able to like hug them or kiss them or look at them afterwards yeah. to make sure you're okay. Yeah. You keep texting, are you sure we're cool? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, are you sure? Yeah. You're like, like, yeah. You're like, are you sure? Because I can't see you right now. Yeah. Both That's of my rough. Both my breakups <laughs> from two long-term relationships, one from the show and then this last one, were actually like solidified via FaceTime. Wow. This last one, I was able to like go and we did have like a final closure yeah. conversation in person, which was really nice. But yeah, that is a very tough part about it. <sighs> yeah. But it's worth it. You just, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> one of the things you spoke about in the workshop that was also another light bulb for me mm. um, was, which honestly is just common sense a little bit Mm -hmm. (laughs) like the foundation of a relationship in order to feel safe and and fulfilled um with having that reliability that consistency um that security piece which was something that was challenged a lot in my last relationship um but that a i find is always an interesting dynamic just as we're talking about long distance creating those kinds of things consistency reliability <laughs> when you are long distance yes. can be difficult and i'm wondering what your experience is like building that foundation in a long distance yeah yeah i've i've done a i've done a decent number of them it's it's you know again it's hard like uh long distance is not ideal because it really mm-hmm. doesn't allow you to utilize all the necessary things like eye contact touch yeah. Um, and like you said, consistency, reliability. So again, mm-hmm. we're kind of, this is what I always do. And I naturally do this with people that are even living local yeah. because I like a lot of closeness and intimacy. Mm-hmm. And a lot of things I'm about to say, some people would be turned off by and they're going to see it as very clingy or codependent. That's cool. That says more about them, not about mm-hmm. me. Cause mm-hmm. for me, it feels very good. Mm-hmm. But I'm one of those people where I text a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm big on sending photos of what I'm doing and yeah. it's not a, a mechanism of control to mechanism of sharing and mm-hmm. caring where I'm like, Hey, Connection. yes, I'm walking down the street. I just got a call. Coffee, I'm FaceTiming, I'm sending a video, mm-hmm. and I like dating people that are the same thing. They're like, oh, I'm at the airport heading home. Here I'm at the airport missing you, and they send mm-hmm. a photo. And so yeah, I'm big so on cute. sending images and photos and videos and um, just constantly trying to find all the ways through technology we can stay connected, mm-hmm. and it's the best you can do. Yeah. And also, you know, I work a lot, but I make sure in terms of, like we said, consistency and reliability that um, I try to be as available as I can between clients, and then I try to also show up to the text messages, which mm-hmm. is with as much presence as possible because yeah. it's all you got sometimes mm-hmm. you're not going to see them that night to sleep yeah. over yeah um, that's why i'm a big fan of voice messages yes. during the audio notes yes yeah love those <laughs> and it throws some people off at first because they don't expect that to come in yeah but to hear their voices like there's something really powerful in them and i'm i'm mm-hmm. big fan of those too but it throws some people yeah. off they're like oh, i didn't even know we had that function i'm like yeah it's right here yeah. and now we're gonna use it all the time that's right i love yeah. that yeah. yeah so i'm so curious what what's your sign scorpio Ah, I was thinking. <laughs> Why? What did you think it was going to be? It sounds like I let you down. Uh, Taurus? I was thinking, I, like, we ha- seem to have some of these things in common. And I was like, oh, I wonder if he's like, I thought you might be a cancer too. Oh, no. I'm a cancer. And so I feel like I'm very. Scorpio. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything about astrology though. So. I mean, I feel like it actually, it does have some. Cool. Like, I'm not like hardcore, okay. but I'm like, everything I read about a cancer is like 
it's me. So have you dated anyone whose sign was incompatible with yours that proved to be truly compatible or incompatible? Did does it play out as Yeah, I mean my longest relationship was one that's like supposed to be compatible, Virgo and Cancer. Okay, and cool. then Sagittarius and Cancer are a bit difficult. And that's been my lo- that was my first relationship <laughs> when I uh had my sexual debut, my mm-hmm. virginity with. Right on. Um and then yeah, my last two were Sagittarius. And now I'm moving away <laughs> from Sagittarius and <laughs> dating someone who's an Aries, which I've never dated before. Okay. Yeah, one of my worst relationships, I know what the sign was, and I don't know if we're supposed to have been compatible or not, but because of the experience <laughs> yes. I, I've determined it to be not compatible. Yes. And when people mention it, I'm like, Yeah, no. <laughs> no, yes. no Gemini. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gemini's can be tough. My mom's a Gemini. Yeah. Oof. No, thank mm. you. Yeah. I no mean, good. I consider that a piece of compatibility. <laughs> um, but one thing that I think was my biggest light bulb in the training and something I shared on social media as well that people had a lot of questions around <laughs> was distinguishing romantic orientation oh, yeah. to sexual orientation. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most valuable thing about the distinction between romantic orientation and sexual orientation is, 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 is it's in the people's lives where it doesn't line up. So I use it as a normative tool to make people feel like normal. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I'll work with some people again where they'll say, you know, there's one gender that I tend to date or I only date. Yeah. And then they'll say, however, sexually I have ideas or fantasies or experiences that bump into mm-hmm. something a little opposite of that. Yeah. And they get confused and I'll say, okay, well, sexually you might be very open or fluid, mm-hmm. but romantically you're just very much into men or women or whatever it is. And that it's not uncommon or shocking. A lot of people's romantic and sexual lineup so they've never had to unpack this or talk about it but yours is distinct and my life has very much mirrored that and that was really powerful to understand that um and there's so much in that right Mm -hmm. like i I, you know why why for some people is it so separated and i think there's a lot in there Mm -hmm. um homophobia slut shaming um misogyny like there's so much in there that we'll never know what our core romantic or sexual orientation would be because it's really hard to just work through all of that Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like we're in it and mm-hmm. we're further along than most people, but we're still beat up by it. Like, I'm mm-hmm. still shocked where I'll be like, wow, I just thought that or mm-hmm. I just said that about someone in my head. Yeah. Man, mm-hmm. and I should be further along and I still mess up. And so yeah. I hold a lot of grace for people that are struggling. But anyway, long story short, yeah, there's a big distinction between mm-hmm. the two. And culturally, we have to start talking more about it um, because, yeah, your sexuality doesn't necessarily determine who you want to have long-term romantic relationship mm-hmm. with. Relationship with. Yeah. yeah. And you said that that kind of mirrored your experience? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm still figuring it all out. Uh, Because, again, I think that our sexuality and our romanticism should all be an open-ended thing that Mm -hmm. we're always letting evolve because who we are should always be changing. Mm -hmm. It is in every other area, right? Like if we're talking about food and I'm constantly discovering new things that I didn't realize I liked or I thought I hated it and I find it in another cuisine with some other flavor and I'm like, wow, this isn't as bad as I thought. We we allow that with movies where people be like, oh, I used to hate horror movies or rom-com and then I saw this and I liked it or even musical taste, right? But sex somehow we're like, oh, you come out as gay or straight or whatever it is and then you're like done. are yeah, forever <laughs> totally and i've just been in different camps sexually and relationally and um had boundaries pushed or mm-hmm. had different experiences and it's like wow i have the capacity to be attracted to that and not to that and mm-hmm. it's just so interesting so i just really stay open and go where yeah. i feel drawn yeah 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 and i think as as i reflect on that for myself it's been it's been interesting i i re- <laughs> i remember i was in middle school no i had i was like a freshman i had just moved to maryland and Mm -hmm. my closest friend from south carolina who i was in there with middle school with came up to visit me and this was when katie perry's i kissed a girl came out (laughs) of course (laughs) and we made some video that we thought was like so funny (laughs) that was like us jamming out dancing and then the chorus came on and like we made out and then we like stopped and then we like went back to dancing (laughs) and we posted it (laughs) And we posted it on Facebook yeah. and my mom's friend saw it and we didn't think anything of it, right? Like we were just like, ha ah, yeah, like whatever. Yeah. Like we had made out before, not in like a romantic way, but just in like a, I don't know, experimenting and sure. like truth or dare at parties. Right. And when that came out, I remember the response 
was so interesting from my mom of just like, you need to take it down. Like, you know, like that's not how you interact with like your girlfriends. Like those are your friends. And there's a boundary between friendship yes. and romanticism, sexuality. Yes. And, and, and people think you're a lesbian. Yeah. And I was like, you know, I didn't fully like identify with that. And, and I was just kind of like, you've never made out with any of your friends. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? It's it's such an interesting binary in our culture, right? Like we don't have terms for all the different ways we can relate mm-hmm. to people. And that's yeah. why it's very confusing because we still don't even have a good term for that. Because I agree with you. I, I have friends in my life where we've had different sexual experiences and it was born out of a moment mm-hmm. or a desire to be a little closer than we could get sitting yeah. next to each other on the couch. And for some people, they're like, that's very odd. Friends don't do that. And it's like, no, but they do. They do. Or friendships come out of something that was just yeah. kind of sexual. And we realized we only wanted something less romantic or sexual you know it's just interesting but um yeah people panic around that yeah and and now it's been the the question of you know i've received this a few times of just like am i bisexual and like what what am i into and and it's i think i've always been hesitant to say i'm heterosexual or i'm bisexual or whatever because then i think that that automatically gives people an idea of what I date romantically. That's and right. so if I say I'm bisexual, Bam. then it's like shame around, well, she's never really dated a girl. So she's just like doing that to over-sexualize, you know, female, uh, female sexual interactions. Yeah. And for me, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. There's definitely a difference there. There's definitely room there. And even, um, Erica Lust, uh, films, yeah. Yeah. I've been exposing myself more and more to. And, there's all kinds of different people on there. But that's my and point. And I'm like, That's I'm like, my oh. point. When you enter open, you realize that you can actually get arousal or have your, you know, desire yeah. landing on some really interesting things and places. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. there was, right. um, I, I mean, I think all people can be beautiful, right? But having like a sexual attraction to them is different. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, there was a film where there was like a... Um, I'm getting my brains confused right now. I want to say it was a trans woman. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's like, when it's... I'm like, why are you asking me? <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> it, well, it, was, it, it was, was something. sex were... of a woman that was now sex of a man. Uh, That's, uh, you would say uh, trans... A female to male? Yes. So trans male. Trans male. Yeah, trans male. Trans male. And yeah, I was like, oh, wow. Like that was actually like a very hot, like yeah. sexy yeah. thing that mm-hmm. I was like, I wouldn't have thought that that would have initially turned me on. Right. Now, would I go come right out and be like, yeah, I'm pansexual. Right. Like, I don't necessarily know. But again, yeah. that's very different from romantic <clears throat> orientation Correct. of who I want to like long term date. And it's an interesting political time because I think a lot of people that have grown up identifying as uh, gay or trans I think for them, uh, um, those identities have been really powerful politically because they've mm-hmm. had a lot of um, violence against them. Yeah. So I know that there's some people in those communities that do push back on people that are more hetero-identified mm-hmm. taking on those labels. Yeah. I'm a fan, though, of us not even having to decide. Yeah. Because I think that that, again, is it creates a struggle that doesn't need to be, am I gay? Am I straight? Am I bi? And it's like, it yeah. doesn't matter. And we don't even need to worry about those things. Just be, mm-hmm. right? And so we're getting to a point in uh, identity politics where we're going to just move away from identifying fires because it's going to mean less Mm -hmm. um and they also just trap you they do they really do yeah so Mm -hmm. i understand that they need to exist for people to occupy space and to get rights but um i'm again more from like a postmodern perspective of like none of these things are real constructs anyway and they trap us and limit us Mm -hmm. and let's just like get rid of them yeah you know same with mental health diagnoses, mm-hmm. but that's like a whole nother conversation. Yeah, no, you had some like very... <laughs> <laughs> Triggers people some of that, you know? But... Yeah, well, no, I really appreciated part of what you brought to the training around <laughs> really kind of shedding some light on the biases around, you know, things like the DSM yeah. and how disorders are diagnosed and um, how a lot of that is actually just like lacking a lot of context and perspective. That's right. Which again, yeah, coming from like a, you know, bachelor's in psych and master's in clinical mental health counseling yeah. is like these things are taught, like these things are really ingrained in us, they right? <laughs> you're, you're ingrained to believe that they're real. You're mm-hmm. ingrained to believe that they're necessary and they have a place, but I think what they tend to do is they pathologize things that are different yeah and that's always my big issue Mm -hmm. is it sees anything that's different as a disorder versus just a creative different alternative way of being which it which it is and there's a lot of value and strength in these other ways of being Mm -hmm. totally yeah It, it was interesting to like 
notice and be aware of my reaction and my process mm. as you were saying some of these things. <laughs> yeah. But but towards the end, I was like, yeah, no, like I I do see that, and, and yeah. again, I think there's, I think there is space for both. That's right. Um, they're they're like some of these things are very valid, and in other contexts, they're like very not relevant. Yeah. Um. It's a balance. It's a journey. It's a journey. And there's a lot of unlearning to do. Because, again, academia is decades behind what's Mm -hmm. happening. And we have to be able to accommodate and relate to the millennials and those that are coming behind them who just aren't interested in diagnoses or gender terms or sexuality Mm -hmm. terms. And so we have to just kind of catch up. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing to me. Mm -hmm. It scares some people, though. Change is scary. Yeah, sure is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and, that's one of the funniest things about doing these trainings is to see who's resistant yeah. and who's open. But the Seattle bunch was just shockingly open. <laughs> yeah. Like there's no debates. But, I'm used to getting debated. Yeah. <laughs> We're, I mean, we're also very passive aggressive. So <laughs> all the debating happened behind my back after I left. <laughs> They're like that Probably. guy. Probably, I don't know. I oh, don't that's know. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, you know what's funny? Let's talk about that for one second, though. Um, I definitely noticed the Seattle chill. Yeah, it's very, that's real. And, and that's one thing, maybe why I'm always in long distance relationships, because good, like okay. dating there, people are generally like very passive and it's just, it's so chill. And I'm like, wait, no, like I need like, we nothing need gets off the ground. Talk. Yeah, exactly. So what's it like making friends? Um, it, it's interesting. I do feel very lucky that when I first moved back to Seattle, I got in with like a very welcoming, very open oh, nice. group of like entrepreneurs cool um but outside of that like for instance going out in ballard like it is very like people go out in their groups of friends <sighs> and you really do have to just like have some courage to like slide in there <laughs> and Couldn't do it. hope that they're uh hope that they're open it's, yeah. it's a very interesting community i do feel like i have found my community of people there which is part of why you know it feels like home to me but yeah, the the passiveness is not. Happy to hear that because I was wandering around and I'm so friendly and everywhere I went, I was trying to talk to people and they just stared at me like at the coffee shops and the clothing stores. They just would look at me and I was like, "It's so chilly. Yeah. <laughs> like y'all are not warm. It's warm in here. You got the fire going, the hot chocolate, but it's it's chilly." Wow. Yes, it does. It depends like what neighborhood you're in too. Okay. I think. Yeah. All right. I didn't get too far yeah. away from the hotel, but <laughs> yeah, the, the hotel area was not a not a super fun area. Okay. Um, but you did just bring up millennials <laughs> yes. and some of the things that there's doing these days and something I learned was about sides. Can you share with us oh, about sides? Yeah. Because I want to talk about like <clears throat> yes. uh, non-monogamy a little Beautiful. bit, but I had never heard of sides before. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, so you know, we're such a penetratively obsessed and focused culture, yes. right? Where we think that that's the goal of sex, that is sex. And if we mm-hmm. can't do that, then we're not able to have sex or we yeah. didn't fully have sex. And, you know, I, my example is always, for those that don't believe oral or hand jobs or any of that stuff is truly sex, it's like, okay, well, are you monogamous? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, do you allow your partner, not allow, but are you okay with your partner doing those things? They're like, well, no. And I'm like, why? Because yeah. it's sexual, mm-hmm. right? So it's sex. Yeah. Okay. But my point was more that there are some people that are not into penetration. Mm-hmm. And again, it's kind of like the romantic versus sexual orientation. It's very shockingly normalizing for people to go, oh my gosh, wait a minute. I never realized that, mm-hmm. th- that there's a healthy label for me, someone who doesn't want to be penetrated or to penetrate. And that instead of being a top or a bottom, and this doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, mm-hmm. that you're a side, you're someone yeah. who wants other forms of sexuality and that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's shocking though to, for someone to maybe say, I don't want to penetrate or be penetrated. It's mm-hmm. like, what? <laughs> so you don't have sex? And they're like, no, I have a robust sex life. I use my yeah. mouth. I use my penis. I use my vagina. It's just, I'm not penetratively driven. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that can be so empowering for people to hear. And I think especially, you know, a lot of the people that listen to the podcast are women. And I think that can be really empowering for, you know, people that identify as, as women to, right. to hear because sometimes penetration can be painful. Sometimes sure. they're struggling to reach orgasm and that's they right. feel like that's the only way that they can do that. And knowing that there are these other ways and feeling empowered in that, I think can be really beneficial to yeah. sex life. Because one of the diagnoses uh, around sexuality that I challenge is vaginismus, which is about painful penetration. And I say it impl- it assumes that one should enjoy, want, and be able to be penetrated for a length of time. And it's like, but why? Yeah. Why does that have to be? Why can't there be people that just don't enjoy it so they don't relax enough to enjoy mm-hmm. it or to find pleasure in it? Um, or it's painful because it, it all ties into like, I want people to have the kind of sex that feels good and makes sense to them. And I mm-hmm. don't want them to force their bodies into a state that they're not naturally really about. Yes. 
Yeah. And so if you want to be penetrated, it's painful. There's ways to work on that. But for some people, they're like, you know what? I, it's okay for me to realize it's just not something that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, again, just even having access to this kind of knowledge and, and conversations can help people realize that. I hope so. Too. Yeah. Um, and so since since I attended the training, mm-hmm. I feel like this is something I have said to people several times over and over again as I talk about sex like every day, um, is talking about sexual dysfunctions as more sexual disappointments. That's right. Which like kudos that's fantastic i don't know if you came up with that but it, it yeah that worked. That was... i mean the whole point for the whole point is that i want i believe therapy or i believe what the world needs is for people to be able to have less shame and to just feel mm-hmm. okay as they are yeah like just to be able to be authentic um and to be like this is me this is what my body looks like or this is how my body functions or this is who i am sexually i uh you know date women but i have sex with any gender or i don't like penetration and that's okay or um this whole topic which is you know my penis Penis just unfortunately doesn't always get hard or stay hard mm-hmm. for the length of time that most people might prefer. Yeah. And so I use my penis when, when it's hard and, and is doing what I want to do. And when it doesn't, that's cool because sex is far bigger than just my penis mm-hmm. and penetration. And I'll go down on you and use my fingers or toys. And we're just here to have fun because what is sex supposed to be about? Fun, fun. pleasure, connection, yeah. right? There's no right way. There's no goal. And so yeah. it's just about people feeling okay. And so when I say that to people that own a penis, like it's okay that it's doing what it's doing. It can come as fast as it comes or it can take as long as it takes or it doesn't stay hard whatever it is that's cool yeah. it's okay and they're like what i'm not i'm not dysfunctioned and i'm like no mm-hmm. you have some disappointments because you have this perspective as to how it should be but like penises function all sorts of different kinds of ways yeah yeah and i think the the area where it becomes uh what people would say not medically but right. like functionally yes. dysfunctional yes. is when it's something that inhibits them from experiencing that connection with their partner that's right like coming too fast sure that it's like, oh, well, now I didn't get to enjoy myself because my partner has already completed. And now this feels like a dysfunction in our relationship. But I would, even those moments, like, you know, the idea that you and your partner are going to come at the same, same time. time. People that have told me they do that. I'm like, Bless. how? Bless. There's a girl in grad school that her and her, her, and her boyfriend. <laughs> Y'all are magic. Every Y'all time. are magic. Because most of my sexual experiences is usually one of us getting off and then the other one gets off. And mm-hmm. we're both just happy to have gotten pleasure and help the other one get some pleasure yeah. and, like no complaints yeah. you know what i mean but you got to be willing and cool enough to hang in there there's some people yeah. that are like i'm good i'm done usually of course that's the male yeah. identified person mm-hmm. doing that yeah but um yeah yeah, hmm. yeah i don't <laughs> i think it's interesting <laughs> the like just the science around female and and male mm-hmm. identifying parts yeah. coming and and how different those orgasms can be yes but that but i want <laughs> what i want people to take away from that is that it's complex yeah and super. there's no right way and it's mm-hmm. not gonna be the same way for everyone some people it's gonna take more time some people are gonna need multiple levels of stimulation to get there other yeah. people it's really important that they're with someone they feel safe and relaxed with other people they want to be more anonymous and checked out mm-hmm. um for I mean, it's just it's all over the place yeah. and there's just no right yeah. way i mean that's what i always take away from that kind of research mm-hmm. Yeah, and and to me, again, with discussing, like, timing on some of this stuff, right, yeah. and how these things flow, um, this is kind of where I transition us into non-monogamy because um, when you do feel dissatisfied in your sex life like that, mm-hmm. I think there is an opportunity. Granted, I don't think if you're at a bad place in your relationship that, you know, just jumping right into an open relationship is necessarily the best way to go. But I do think there is space for understanding how complex our sexual desires can be and those experiences can be. And just the dynamic between just two people can be incredibly complex and and sometimes really complicated um, to where, you know, perhaps there is space for inclusion or just separate experiences. Some form of diversification. (laughs) I mean, what's so funny is we, I mean, we are living longer and longer. Mm -hmm. So there's going to come a point where people are going to be alive till they're, what, 140 or 150. The idea that you're going to be married to the same person for 120 years and only have sex with that one person. Because let's say you get married at 30 mm-hmm. and you live till 150 or 160 at some point. That's 130 <laughs> years that you're supposed to be with one person. But that's so romantic. It's it's romantic, but it's unrealistic <laughs> as hell. It is. It just is. Mm-hmm. And God bless. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh my God. That is horrifying. But I've never been married for decades. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be... 
<laughs> have you, so this is more of a, a personal question and sure. if you don't feel comfortable answering, sure. you totally don't have to. Um, so in your personal experience is like consensual non-monogamy something that you've experimented with or something oh, that yeah. you've like been able to. I've been in every relational configuration because my theory <laughs> yeah. is, I like how you laugh. You're like, I'm, I'm not shocked. Yeah. I know. I think it's because like, you know, doing the work I do, I just am aware of that because something makes me anxious that doesn't make it, that doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. Absolutely. And I'm also sex positive in my thinking, which means I don't shame any way of being. I don't shame monogamy. I don't mm-hmm. shame non-monogamy. Yeah. I'm open to whatever is possible or needed by me and the people I'm with. Mm-hmm. So I've been in relationships where based on who we were and what we're trying to do, non-monogamy made sense. Mm-hmm. But then I've been in relationships where monogamy made sense. Yeah. And so I've done every different configuration. And I always tell people, just remember, it's not, it doesn't have to be a permanent decision. You can say, let's try this, non-monogamy, let's try open, or let's try monogamy, whatever it is. And we'll keep checking in on how that's going mm-hmm. and if we need to make changes. Yes. That could be movement. Yes. I love that. And I think once people feel like they've committed to something, yes. that like that's what it has to be. Same that's thing right. with like identifying with a sexual orientation. That that's, that's right. I've, I've said I'm heterosexual. Now I have to be heterosexual forever. Um, and I think there is like such freedom in knowing that you can touch base yes. and, and change the dynamic to best suit your relationship because the way you have it set up might not be functionally working, might not be actually satisfying for either party. And, and what's more okay. important to you? Because I think what I always tell people is if, 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 you're real, if your true goal is I want, I want to keep this person in my life and I love them, well, then do what you have to mm-hmm. do to be able to keep them, which might mean changing the relational configuration. Yeah. And it's not going to be a loss. It's going to be a way to actually keep. But people mm-hmm. would sometimes rather completely let go of the relationship. Yeah. Then opening up in one way. And it's like, yeah. wait a second. You mm-hmm. you love me so much that you'd rather completely leave me than have me, but allow it to be open in some form. Mm-hmm. Now that's odd. Which to me, I think just does speak a lot to the ego. Yes. Right. And and to me, one of the things, again, not that I'm shaming monogamy, but that one of the things I have found beautiful about mm-hmm. non-monogamy is just that there is this selflessness yes, to the love. Yes, it's one of the most selfless things ever. Yeah. It's saying, I love you so so much that I'm not going to hold you back from something that makes sense to you. Yeah. I have such great love for you that I want to honor what you're going to find joy and pleasure in. Um, mm-hmm. But again, I've been in all sorts of configurations. I've been in configurations where, and this sounds so bizarre to some people, but where uh, a partner of mine was open and I wasn't yeah. because I was honest and I was like, I do not have the time or energy mm-hmm. to be with anyone else. Yeah. It, it, You do. And so let's set some boundaries around that in ways that feel safe to both of us. And you go experience what you need to when you're traveling mm-hmm. or even home or whatever. But like, I'm, I, I, I I just love you and want to be with you and I don't need anything else. Yeah. That is shocking to people though. Yeah. Now, That's see, like next level. In, in that though, do you have the don't ask, don't tell? Or are you wanting that inclusiveness in terms of knowing what's going on? Um, I, <laughs> This is getting honest. <laughs> I I was turned on by a lot of the idea of it. And so yeah. I would want them to come talk to me. Not yeah. so much as like, this is the person because it wasn't me trying to police or control. It was more, I want to hear about the experiences yeah. because it turned me on to think of them with someone else. Yeah, it's like your own personal porn. 100%. And I was definitely the person that was like take videos if they're open mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. So no, I mean I'll be very vulnerable Please. because you're being vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you. Meet me there. Um, no, that was one of my recent relationships. Okay. Um, I didn't experience pleasure from him being with other people. Um, I was totally like fine with it and wanted him to experience happiness there. But it wasn't something that turned me on. I okay. did want to know all the details, but for him, it was very like same thing very much turned him on um i i was always too like scared to do the videos because i was like i don't know how to approach this (laughs) um but but we did do other things like audio nice which i it it was very outside my comfort zone and i was like i don't know how to do this but it (laughs) there were parts of it that were very fun and that felt very freeing and that felt like wow, this person is really allowing me and and encouraging me to experience myself sexually and to explore myself sexually. And that wasn't something I had ever experienced in a relationship before that did feel like an... uh, like an, like a new sense of, of freedom and empowerment it's, around my sexuality. And also it's an act of care. Yeah. That that this person's saying like, I want to honor who you are, who we are. Um, and you're saying, I want to uh, somehow allow you to participate whatever ways you can with that. And yeah. this person's like, I love you so much. I want you to feel liberated and free and not mm-hmm. trapped. Because mm-hmm. relationships shouldn't be about feeling trapped. But people yeah. really think that. 
Yeah. That like, oh, you get married and then blah, blah. And I'm like, no, no. It should, I got married and then I had someone to go do more in the world with. Mm-hmm. My life expanded. Yeah. It shouldn't be this uh, controlled ownership reduced model where mm-hmm. like all of a sudden I give up fun and my friends and my hobbies. But like yeah. people see it that way. Yeah. That's not what it should be about. Yeah. And that's where, I mean, most of those things are centered around the concept of monogamy. Right. right. And that's where I think... For me, I I do want to encourage and challenge people to make sure that they're being assertive in choosing the kind of relationship dynamic that they want and that they're not just defaulting because that's what they think they have to be in. And I think... And unfortunately, there are ways that like all of these different relationship dynamics can be toxic and can be really unhealthy. And we have a lot of... uh, a lot of hold on, on monogamy and, and tr- trouble processing that jealousy. And so it sounds like for you personally, at least that the, je- I'm sure you did experience oh, jealousy on some of course, point. Of course, um, of course. I know for my ex, it was also just like the competition piece was like yeah. a big turn on. Sure. So it's, it's interesting to allow space for both the jealousy and the turn on. Yeah, and I think we have to just also know culturally that jealousy doesn't mean we have to do anything with it. We can just acknowledge yeah. we're jealous. We can also lovingly share with our partner and have them not think they have to stop what they're doing. They can just say, I hear you. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm sorry you're jealous. I and mean, there's just so many ways to work with it. But I think we run our relationships that if I'm jealous because of something, either you being friends with an ex or you wanting to go out with your friends and not take me, that then you shouldn't do it and it's yep. bad and I have a right to punish you when you come home. And it's like, no. And I said this in the training. People have a right to say, I don't accept your jealousy or that's mm-hmm. a misplaced jealousy or I love love you, but yeah. I'm going to do it anyway. It's okay that sometimes mm-hmm. you don't like the things I do. Yeah. But that's big for people. It it's is like, big. <laughs> it is really big. All these things are really big. It's and and stuff. part of me, you know, as we go through the training and you're sharing all these things, some of it is like big for me, but then I'm also like, wow, this is probably like super big for some of my listeners where oh, I'm just yeah. like, I want to like just take all this information and just like <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Like, not everyone's going to take all this, absorb it, and it's going to make sense to them or be utilized in their mm-hmm. life. So I think for some people, the work is just about um, seeing how how you can apply it in minor, minor ways. Like, you're not necessarily maybe going to go home and open your marriage or mm-hmm. start being more, you know, gender or sexually fluid, but yes. maybe you can at least relate to your friends differently who are, or maybe you can just use this to say that there are other ways of being sexual that might not be comfortable for me, but I, I am I'm realizing that they're not bad and I don't have to shame them when I hear about it in other people. Mm-hmm. So there's like ways you can work with this that aren't necessarily yeah. you directly changing your own relationship. Mm-hmm. Cause I just want people to be better to other people. Yeah. Like don't slut shame them. Don't mock them. Don't say if you're in an open relationship, you don't love each other. Like oh, at least do that. I, at least have your attitude shift. Mm-hmm. I had to block someone this morning that commented <laughs> something about, you know, you, I don't think you've ever really been in love because you've had this, you know, openness. Patronizing, and, right? Yeah. How patronizing. They know better than you do. Yeah. I know. I know. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And I like that you have this, you know, emphasis on just wanting people to be better in their relationships and to feel better in their relationships. And part of what we talked about as well is our own relationship with sex, like individually. Yes. Um, And I guess also partnered, but you you talked a lot about like sex as a way to soothe. And this was part of where my like clinical brain was like, (laughs) (laughs) hold on a second. Hold on a second. Red flag, red flag, red flag. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Yeah. And and I and I I understood where you're coming from. And I think for me, a big part of that is like intention. Yeah. So maybe if you could share a little bit about kind of what your what your mindset is around your encouragement of people using yeah. sex as a way to soothe. You know, it's, it's all, it's all around. So the work isn't, uh, how do I say this? So I'm always looking at things on a micro and a macro level. So mm-hmm. some of the things I say are just to try to get us to think differently in general. Yeah. So some of it's just to challenge people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So yes. there's that. I think that's the Scorpio in <laughs> yeah, you yeah. actually. <laughs> so some of it I'm just like poking <laughs> buttons and I'm like, yo, we have to all just be more open and unlearn some things. And, yeah. um, and it's kind of like, you know, if we live on one end of the uh, spectrum, I'm mm-hmm. trying to bring up, I, I know we're not going to land on the far other end, but we might land in the middle. Mm -hmm. And so I try to take us all to the other side, knowing we're going to then revert at least to the middle. So it's like, we're going to inch a little bit. But having said that, I I think it's me philosophizing in that. I think it's interesting how you could fill in any activity and say, Hey, Mm -hmm. this is a way to self-soothe if you're feeling anxious or depressed or you had a rough day and you could list any activity 
But for most people, if you said to them, you implanted a sexual thing, they yeah. then panic. Mm-hmm. And, and the thought was like, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And that it's like, that's unhealthy. Yes. Mm-hmm. Even if we do nothing with that, isn't it interesting that you can run, do yoga, go to the gym, eat different, cook, meditate, read a book, uh, play the guitar, jump on your trampoline, play with your dog. But if you say masturbate or have sex at home, we're like, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. What? <laughs> How is that a healthy mechanism for your anxiety or to cope yep. or to self-care? So you can take a bath, but masturbate, you can take a bath, but porn, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like, let's just sit with that for a second. Yeah. You know, culturally, that's fascinating. Yeah. And since it's only been in the last year and a half that I've actually like intentionally started masturbating and like experiencing my own self-pleasure. And it now whenever people do ask me, you know, because my background in mental health, people are always like, how do you cope with your feelings and stuff? And like, what do you, how do you cope with anxiety? And I was like, masturbation (laughs) and like watching people's faces they get so on they do they get so uncomfortable and i'm like it it it's true like and it doesn't mean that i'm like sex craves or i'm like all all the like or i'm a slut or any of these things but it is a way to like physically relieve some anxiety in your body and also kind of like prevent you from potentially being in really unhealthy sexual dynamics out of confusion that's right. right And again, I just want us to honor that like any body technology is a body technology. And whether you're manipulating your body and your neurochemistry with meditation, yoga, fasting, diet, sleeping more, exercise, whatever it is, masturbation Mm -hmm. is the same thing. It's just another technology, a way to use your body. And it shouldn't, and it's another way to even be spiritual. Mm -hmm. Some people use sexuality as a way to transcend themselves and to go into a spiritual space. And it's like, again, if you can do all the other practices, prayer, chanting, Mm -hmm. meditation, yoga poses, um, the chakra thing, all of it, like, why can't this be? Because it it actually is. And and it's just another body technology. I love thinking about it like that. Yeah. I think that can be super, super helpful for people. Mm Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Mm. There's honestly, I have a whole <laughs> list of notes of things that I was just like, this is all great content yeah, um, and great conversations to have. And I super appreciate your vulnerability and also just like lending your education as well. Um, I wasn't sure if there's anything specific that you would want to make sure that you share with listeners. I know one thing that I thought would just be super important to note was about the information on prep that you shared with us, oh, that that could yeah. just be yeah. a really good, important piece for people to be educated <laughs> sure. on. But Yeah, so prep is an interesting topic. It's it's a daily pill that you take, and it has a higher efficacy rate, uh, more so than condoms, because condoms, I think, are about like a 96% uh, rate at preventing the transmission of um, HIV, but prep is, uh, I think, like 99%. Mm-hmm. So basically, basically, it's a daily pill you take. It's for all genders, all sexual orientations. And if you're on it and you're taking it as prescribed, you cannot get HIV. Mm-hmm. So we are we are able to prevent the transmission of HIV if you take that. In addition, yeah. um, it's also important to know U equals U, which means undetectables, untransmittable. Those that are taking the medication as prescribed that are HIV positive and have gotten their viral lo- load down to undetectable cannot transmit that to someone else as well. Mm-hmm. So if you are currently negative and on PrEP, you can't become positive. If you are currently positive but taking your meds, you cannot transmit it. And New York City yesterday just came out saying that they're um, hoping to eradicate new um, transmission rates in the next couple of years in the city. Wow. Because they've knocked it down so low because people are on meds and taking um, what they need to take. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it's a huge thing. So if you're highly sexually active, high Mm -hmm. risk, take PrEP every day. You're solid. Dang. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for for sharing that. I thought that was really important information. Um, (laughs) I do want you to share just kind of where people can find yes. you and how they can follow you. Yeah, so I do Love Line. It's in 32 mm-hmm. different cities. So, you know, look at your local radio station. Also, it's on the radio.com app streaming Monday through Thursday, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And my Instagram is at Dr. Donahue. Mm-hmm. Twitter is at Chris Donahue. And uh, my books are Rebel Love mm-hmm. and Sex Outside the Lines. Yes. And I was going to say to to – leave us here one of the things i think i appreciate the most about your work is just that you are expanding people's perceptions definitions knowledge experiences around sex yes yes yeah transformation yes absolutely well thank you so much yeah thanks for for having me yeah this has been wonderful 
All right, that does it for today's episode. Thank you so much for making it all the way through and keeping your ears, your hearts, and your minds open. It would mean so much to me if you could take a second or two after listening to this episode to leave a review on iTunes and let me know what you're enjoying about the show. I love reading you know, what your favorite episodes are, where you guys listen, um, and definitely feel free to share this with a friend. I mean, part of how we break down the stigmas around these topics is by talking about them, right, and, and sharing them with more people. So definitely share the podcast. Um, and again, really wanting to include all of you in this podcast. So if you have questions or you want to share a thought or an experience, please send in a voice memo to ask.letstalkaboutit at gmail.com. And I'm really excited to keep having these conversations and uh, breaking down these stigmas. So thank you all so, so, so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll talk to you next time. Thank you.